Now, let's go through the perennialist curriculum. The perennialists pay a lot of attention to, uh, to 20 odd things and I will describe them here. Now, the first one is they, they give a lot of importance the, the notion of the great book program or more commonly called the liberal arts which will discipline the mind and cultivate the intellect to read the books in its original language students must learn latin greek students also had to learn grammar rhetoric logic advanced mathematics and philosophy so this was one notion especially from the western world and i'm sure being part of the eastern world we can resonate to this idea only thing certain variables may change but we still believe uh, that in order to understand, I mean, one should take trouble to learn one's culture, tradition, literature in its authentic form. And therefore, uh, languages beyond uh, the popular commercial language, such as English or Bahasa Malaya, Malaya, Bahasa Kebangsan, may not be sufficient because one needs to probably go deeper in Arabic. Uh, Sanskrit, Tamil, uh, Mandarin, um, in whatever traditional language one needs in order to fully understand certain dimensions of their own cultural and traditional upbringing. So this is one of the major uh, approaches. Now the next one, the study of philosophy is crucial part of the perennialist curriculum. This is why uh, this was because they wanted students to discover those ideas that are most insightful and timeless in understanding human condition. See, one thing the perennialists is, is they have never escaped the past. They are very strong that uh, on this notion that that life, regardless of uh, how the time has moved, it was very. Uh, the romantic notion of life was really great then and the closer we think about the past and, and the continuum of the past to the present the, the <coughs> more meaningful life is so and, and another thing is philosophy they have given great prominence to the notion of why how and particularly why things occur because they believe a philosophical underpinning is very crucial to to develop a student. The the next thing that the perennialist syllabus talks given great importance is, um, in fact, there was a, a the perennialists were not keen on allowing students to take electives, except for a second language, for instance, such as vocational and life adjustment subjects so one could take maybe if you really like a, a language and maybe uh, a particular area of science because they felt science was a vocational subject it was based on on uh, empirical evidence or maybe something else on industrial relevance industrial subjects or something like that they argued that this subject denied students opportunity to fully develop the rational power in fact uh, there was once an um, uh, elder uh, proposed a book uh, in, her, in his book, the Padaya proposal, recommending uh, a single elementary school, secondary school for all students. The educational disadvantage had spent the same time in preschool. Now, basically, although it sounds very noble, but what this what the Padaya proposal was trying to say is to bring collectively the entire society, regardless of the spectrum of their social economic status, into a single experience. And most importantly, why the single experience? Because they believe that there is there is a fixed body of knowledge everyone needs to expose to. So if by you staying uh, fragmented in from a social environment and trying to attain education from your own dimension would not give you the single experience that you needed to become the learned man. So Padaya proposal was very noble, but it also came from the notion that everyone had this great single experience that needs to, one, everybody needs to participate in this great single experience. Uh, subsequently, the perennialists criticized the vast amount of disjoint factual information that educators had required students to absorb. They urged their teachers should spend 
more time teaching concepts and explaining how these concepts are meaningful to the students. So this is another interpretation that uh, this segment of philosophers were, as I told you, it comes back to the same thing. They did not want you to come and engage education. I mean, they, their view of education is a tunnel. Regardless of where you are, you all, uh, <coughs> regardless of where you are, you, you f file up, come into a single file, go into the tunnel, gain the experience and come out. So they did not see this, this big blob, blob of mass where everybody just came from wherever you are and, and touched it. So it was a very organized manner. And, and they wanted, as I said, they wanted to really focus on the experience and, and, and most importantly, a, a singular definition of the experience they wanted. Since the enormous amount of scientific knowledge has been produced, teaching should focus on the process of which scientific truths have been discovered. However, the perennialists advise that students should not be taught information that may soon be obsolete and found to be incorrect because future scientists and technological findings, future scientific and technology findings. So their yeah, interpretation to even the knowledge boom was that since it's a knowledge boom, one is not certain of the shelf life of this piece of information or knowledge. So one should focus on, on the philosophical underpinning or the scientific, the rational towards, uh, towards what should I say, uh, towards, uh, towards how the knowledge has been manifested. So that, because the, the process is always true, the process to acquire knowledge or the philosophical questions, the bigger question one needs to ask is always true. What changes is knowledge on the surface? So their interpretation or approach to science, technology and all this, this, uh, this body of knowledge was, it is not so important what you know or what happens or what appears to be on the surface. It's the underlying principles that need to be understood because they will remain true forever. For example, if, if, uh, if I, uh, I went to school, I guess about 15 years ago, and we were definitely thought there were nine planets on Earth. I mean, nine planets in our solar system, one of them being Earth. But I believe now things have changed. Uh, Pluto has been ostracized from the family of our solar system. It's no longer regarded as a planet. But however, if the, if the philosophers or the teachers at that time has emphasized to us the definition of a planet, what constitutes of a planet and, and things like that, then the, the knowledge that I have, would have gained would have still be relevant. But unfortunately, I came from a system that was a very factual based. We were just taught there is nine planets and, you know, the first planet to the ninth and uh, some of them had multiple moons. It was very structured. I mean, it was very superficial in, in some sense. So the knowledge that I've gained is irrelevant. Now, what more if more planets are now uh, classified as no longer planets, then my entire, uh, I guess, middle, uh, uh, middle school science is now questionable. <laughs>